Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, uh, bringing another really awesome guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow uh, for many people out there. Uh, today, we have the, the honor of being joined by Dr. Syra Madad, who is the Senior Director of the System-Wide Special Pathogens Program uh, at New York City Health and hospitals, uh, and health and safety lead for the Enhanced Investigations Unit of uh, New York City Test and Trace Corporation. Uh, her work focuses on the preparedness for response to and recovery from infectious disease outbreaks uh, with an emphasis on healthcare and public health biopreparedness. Uh, Dr. Madad built uh, New York City Health and Hospital Special Pathogen Program literally from the ground up, uh, maintaining readiness for what is the nation's largest the municipal healthcare delivery system. Uh, for all infectious diseases, uh, th that's through ongoing training, education, drills, developing protocols, processes, uh, and more. And she's responsible uh, and responded to, to multiple infectious disease outbreaks, uh, including Ebola, measles, and Zika. Uh, in addition to those responsibilities, Dr. Madad is a fellow at the uh, Harvard Kennedy School Belford Center for Science and International Affairs. There she regularly publishes on the latest uh, health, health guidances, uh, epidemiological concepts, in scientific literature to ultimately help the public uh, keep up to date with these very complex topics. And if you are a, a follower of Netflix or uh, the Discovery Channel, you no doubt have seen her uh, recently on the docuseries Pandemic, uh, How to Prevent an Outbreak and uh, the Vaccine Conquering COVID. Uh, Dr. Madad received her bachelor's uh, in psychology, master's degree in biotech uh, with a concentration in biodefense and biosecurity from University of Maryland, and then went on to do her doctoral degree in health sciences with a concentration on global health from Nova Southeastern University. Um, holding of numerous professional certifications, which we won't go into here, but we will put in the bio of the show. Honored to have her with us today. Uh, Dr. Syra Madad, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much, Ira, for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your uh, on your show. And I, I will mention just one change in my title. So uh, I'm no longer the lead, the health and safety lead of the, the New York City Test and Trace Corp because uh, that uh, that no longer, that particular organization no longer exists. It's shifted into another scope of work because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which reflects where we are today. In today's society, we're no longer, you know, um, in that acute phase of the, of the pandemic. Things are much better. And so with all things uh, from an outbreak response, you know, you transitioned into uh, into additional roles, if you will. So a lot of work obviously is still happening on the pandemic front um, all around, but for that particular role, I'm happy to share that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing other <laughs> other work, if you will. Excellent, excellent. I, I will make note of that in the uh, in the bio of the show. But no, no, it's it's great having you. Um, I, I would love to start off uh, going back a few years because I was really fascinated that um, uh, as an undergraduate, uh, you somehow ended up at USAMRID in a biosafety for lab, uh, working on nasty things like Ebola, um, which when I think about it, you know, whether uh, maybe next to sort of the, the lab that's, uh, you know, decommissioning VX nerve agent or anything nuclear, that's probably one of the scariest things that I could think of possibly doing as an undergraduate. Um, talk a little bit about those days, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I never, never worked at USAMRID, but where that particular story came from is when I was about nine, 10 years old, I was watching the movie Outbreak at Home. 
I have four, I have, I'm one of five uh, children um, and I have two older siblings. And of course, no nine or 10 year old should be watching the movie Outbreak at that age. It's not age appropriate, but they were watching that movie and I sat there watching it with them. And I saw, you know, these scientists and researchers and physicians wearing these, you know, yellow hazmat suits going to hospitals and working on, you know, a highly infectious disease that had significant impact to the community at large. And I remember just turning over to my mom saying, well, that's exactly what I want to do. That's exactly what I want to wear when I go, when I'm in the public, when I'm in the workforce, and that's what I want to do. And she looked at me and she's like, yeah, you're, you're crazy. You're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was actually very inspired at a very young, uh, young age. And as I pursued, you know, my academic, uh, um, you know, my my academic career, um, I actually had the privilege of touring New Sambrid okay. um, during my undergrad studies. And my uh, professor somehow was able to, to you know, um, get me into speaking with some of the scientists there because she knew I was really interested in working with high consequence infectious diseases like Ebola, uh, you know, like uh, you know, stars and MERS and things like that. And so I was able to go and tour you Sambrid and they actually showed me their biocontainment unit, which was still functional at that time. And it was called the slammer. Mm-hmm. And any scientist or researcher that was working at New Sambrid, and if they had exposure, for example, to the to that particular infectious agent, then they would be placed into the slammer for additional evaluation and clinical care. And that's kind of how I uh, you know, was able to to get a little bit of that biocontainment world and see firsthand uh, what it is to work in not only a BSL-4 environment, uh, just observing, but also looking at it from the biocontainment perspective. And now here I am, obviously, uh, many years later, uh, being part of my own biocontainment unit uh, at New York City Health and Hospitals. Within one of our facilities, Bellevue Hospital, we have a biocontainment unit um, that uh, I provide support services to uh, from the system level. Excellent. And um, I just want to, you know, I want to go to 2014 um, before we get to uh, your current responsibilities, because that's when you publish, um, you know, a, a seminal piece of um, of literature entitled Bioterrorism, an Emerging Global Health Threat uh, in the journal Bioterrorism and Biodefense. And this is a you know a key part of your uh, doctoral work uh, where you uh, you take the reader through you know the history of bioterrorism, uh, the tiers of agents, different countermeasures and detection technologies, but then sort of get back to uh, this core theme that is you know what we'll see throughout your career and a lot of what you're doing now, ultimately the first responders and, and this front line that is going to be the first line that finds out about any of these things um, and the ability and the need to build up this this really crucial piece of the puzzle. Talk a little bit about your work uh, at this time and, and how you were thinking of sort of the, the holistic nature of, of biodefense and bioterrorism. Yeah, well, first, you know, we live in a highly globalized world where there are individuals with nefarious intentions and there are bad faith actors, both state and non-state. And so, um, you know, we, we're going to continue to face ongoing threats, uh, ongoing bio threats um, in the form of potentially bioterrorism, um, bio warfare and the like. And that's really just the reality of it. And obviously there are documented cases, both historically and even in modern day, it's take, uh, you know, the 2001 anthrax letter attack that we had here in the United States. Um, And so these are events that are gonna continue to happen. And what's important is that we not only prepare for them, but we make sure that our frontline workforce is able to respond and keep themselves safe. And so a lot of the work that I currently do, even within my role at Health and Hospitals, is really making sure that we are training and educating the frontline workforce and giving them the resources that they need to respond to these types of events as one-off as they may seem, right? So you may think, well, you know, anthrax uh, attack, right? That's not going to happen every day. Maybe, it, you know, we had, you know, an incident obviously in 2001. What's the likelihood of this happening again? Well, you know, you can never say, right? Nobody has a crystal ball to say, well, this is going to happen a couple of times a year or once in a decade. But what's important is that, important is that these are high consequence events. One case is a house on fire. It just takes that one case, right, uh, to, to snowball. And so a lot of the work that I, I do is really making sure that we are preparing the front line, whether these are public health uh, workers or healthcare delivery uh, staff, right, physicians uh, and nurses uh, and infection preventionists working on the front lines and responding to these types of cases. And so to, to give an example, um, most recently, um, I was able to uh, lead two specific simulations with my team. 
and loss of fever. So just a few months ago, we actually ran a loss of fever simulation course at one of our hospitals, Jacoby, uh, and we uh, gathered a number of different uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, infection preventionists, emergency preparedness coordinators, and we actually simulated a patient presenting potentially with loss of fever. You know, how would you screen these patients? How would you isolate these patients? What type of workup would you do? How would you contact public health? And we actually developed protocols of specimen collection once you get that approval from the local health department. And so that's one of the simulations we ran. And the reason for that is because as I look at the threat landscape happening all around us, loss of fever is definitely high up there on my list in terms of um, cases that here in the United States and locally in New York City, we may see, you know, whether it's a week, two weeks, a year, two years, three years from now, right? Nobody really knows. But, you know, I do think there's a higher probability we may see cases of loss of fever, given the fact that there's an ongoing epidemic happening, for example, in Nigeria and other parts of the of the world uh, on a smaller scale. Uh, another simulation that I also ran recently was on anthrax. Uh, and this was testing frontline um, healthcare workers, particularly emergency department staff, um, on how do you detect a case of potential cutaneous anthrax and what are the steps that you would go through? How would you escalate this both clinically as well as to public health? Uh, what would be the role of law enforcement? So I constantly... Um, you know, develop protocols and processes, and we run simulations and drills and exercises, particularly for, you know, our uh, first line responders uh, for these different types of threats, because we know that these are threats that are real. Uh, we don't know when they're going to occur, but we'd rather be prepared than to be underprepared. Mm hmm and, and uh, while we're on the topic of uh, simulations, I, 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 I enjoyed this one um, uh, piece that you wrote. It, it was about something called an incognito embedded patient uh, simulation. And this particular case is focused on Zika. Um, and I thought it was, you know, it's rather elegant. You know, it wasn't like, hey, you know, you have somebody run into the, the emergency room. Uh, I, I think I have some Zika, but you really had to organize, you know, electronic patient records and, uh, you know, basically create this synthetic patient that um, got, you know, people in the, I don't know what which uh, of the 70 facilities that was in, but really gets them, got them thinking, okay, what's going on here? Yeah, really had to set everything up kind of stealthfully. So say a few words about the incognito embedded patient simulation and how, it, 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 in terms of one of the tools that you use uh, in these exercises. Yeah, absolutely. And those that's more of the fun part of my job. So one part is obviously developing guidances and policies and protocols and processes. Um, and everything looks great on paper, right? On paper, right. it looks beautiful. But then when you actually operationalize it, that's when you find the challenges and the gaps. And you need to make sure that when the curtain goes up, when you actually have these types of events happening, you have a sound process in place. And that's where this incognito uh, drills come in place. And what they are also called is mystery patient drills. And I actually do this um, very often with my team, uh, actually sometimes a couple of times a year. And what it is, is we look at the threat landscape and we see what are those infectious disease threats that are likely to, um, you know, basically occur in New York City. And then we build out mystery patient drills or these incognito simulations where we send in a a patient, a fake patient, so it's a real person, and we send them through uh, one of our points of entry that we're testing. So for the Zika that you've mentioned, um, you know, during, I think it was 2016, when we started to see increased levels of Zika activity. And while Zika is not a new virus uh, here in the United States, particularly at hospitals, that was something relatively new that healthcare systems didn't have to contend with before. So we had to build processes on the fly. We did, we actually published an MMWR with CDC to talk about our processes uh, because um, they were so robust. And one of the things we did was um, we wanted to test out our protocols. We wanted to see mm -hmm. how well are they actually working in the real world. And um, we have over a dozen prenatal clinics within our health system. And we actually sent in a fake pregnant patient, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Imagine trying to, to <laughs> stimulate a fake pregnant woman. Um, it was really interesting, but we did it. So we actually um, had some of our staff uh, and um, the, the actor pretended to be pregnant. And she went in with her partner to over a dozen of our prenatal clinics um, and she tested our protocols. And so this was no notice. So the staff had no idea that this was not a real patient. They treated her as if it's a real patient with a scheduled appointment or a walk-in. And we would walk through all the different protocols we put uh, in place. For example, the screening, asking all pregnant women that were coming in for appointments, have you traveled outside the country? Particularly, have you traveled to an area that's reporting outbreaks of Zika so we can do additional screening? So we were testing all these processes. So we did that for Zika. 
And once we get the results, we're able to actually look at it from a system level to say, you know what, these are some of the gaps in our protocols. These are some of the gaps in our processes. We need to change this uh, and let's move forward with that. And the one thing we did find in that particular uh, drill that we conducted was, as uh, folks may remember, um, during the Zika epidemic in 2016, it was very much obviously focused on uh, on uh, those that were pregnant. And as we were learning more about the virus and the impact it was having on the fetus and causing microcephaly and the full spectrum of, uh, of Zika, uh, if you will, um, illness associated with it, um, one of the things we found out um, as science was evolving and we were learning more about the virus is sexual transmission. So a partner mm -hmm. can have Zika and then sexually transmit it to, you know, the uh, the female partner who's pregnant and then she can unfortunately get infected and then her child could also potentially get infected. So one of the things we learned by doing our uh, Zika uh, mystery patient drills was that we were so focused on asking the woman, have you traveled? Um, and if not, we would then go, you know, go, uh, you know, go into our normal uh, patient workflow. We didn't even ask if her partner had traveled. So you may not have mm -hmm. traveled, but did, did, did your partner travel in the last, you know, 21 days? So we realized we weren't asking that question after we collected all this data. And we very quickly added in that questionnaire to our initial screening. And that's why we do these types of drills is we test out our processes. We look at it look at it from a real world standpoint, how is it actually, um, you know, uh, uh, how is it actually flowing? And then we make changes in real time. And we've done these secret chopper drills or mystery patient drills for Ebola. We've done it for Lhasa. We've actually even done it for COVID-19. So right, you know, right when COVID-19 was in the news um, in January of 2020, we started doing our COVID-19 incognito, um, you know, mystery patient drills in February to test out our facilities to see if we started seeing this in New York City how do we respond? And that also helped us build out some of the processes we, we built out, obviously, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and, you know, I, I mentioned in the bio of the show that that your organization in New York City Health and Hospitals, largest municipal health system in the United States, 70 locations servicing about a million New Yorkers every year. Um and, 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 you know, thinking about going back to Outbreak for a minute, I sort of, you know, if you're that amalgam of sort of Kate Winslet and Larry Fishburne and and having those responsibilities, um, you know, we all see the sort of the, something on the news, you know, uh, uh, somebody got on an airplane in country X with hantavirus and, and OK, and, and they're arriving here. I believe that you're the person that then there's that a red phone in your office that goes off when something like that happens. What what happens in your work? I mean, obviously, this doesn't go on twenty four hours a day in your office. I mean, you're doing other cool things, but can you just walk us through, like, in a real world scenario, when something scary like that happens? What's the first couple things you do? Yeah, and that's an excellent question. So I have no red phone. <laughs> um, cool. uh, surprise, surprise. Um, but one of the things that we do within uh, within the team that um, that I have the privilege of, of you know overseeing, if you will, is we look at everything that's happening around the world. And if there is a, a growing infectious disease threat, and I'll give you a real world example right now, because this is what we're actually uh, we're, we're working on is um, avian influenza uh, H5N1, uh, right? So mm -hmm, highly pathogenic mm -hmm. influenza. You're seeing it all over the news where you're seeing, um, you know, a significant rise of of cases uh, in the animal population and um, very uh, few sporadic human to human uh, human cases associated with exposure to these infected animals. But it has a case fatality rate of over, you know, 50%. And so it's mm -hmm. a significant threat. And if we start seeing um, sustained human to human transmission, we're in trouble. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing is, A, we're monitoring what is happening with avian influenza H5N1 all around the world, locally here in the United States and also here in New York. And we're building out protocols and processes um, as we speak. And we're working very closely with the health department of what those protocols and processes should look like. So should New York City start seeing cases of H5N1 in humans or even sustained human to human transmission, right? What does that look like and how do we prepare for it? Um, and then once we develop these protocols and processes, that are currently still in development, we then have to test them. So one of the ways we would test them is, for example, through those incognito, you know, mystery patient drills. And then we're going to do in-service trainings with our staff. So do they know, so they know what type of PPE they should be wearing, what infection prevention and control precautions they should implement, who they call, what the clinical uh, procedure, what the clinical process looks like. So we would test and then drill and uh, exercise um, and educate our staff on all of this. So that's some of the some of the things we're doing 
right now, uh, but it's, it's basically a collaboration with our local health department. So anytime we see a pathogen of concern, my first call really is to my colleagues at the local public health department to say, hey, this is what I'm monitoring. Is this what you're monitoring? What do you think of the threat assessment? Should we, we be should we be worried? And then what type of pro processes and protocols should we develop? And then kind of go on from there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so you've been, needless to say, publishing uh, quite a bit on, on COVID over the last couple of years on topics like operational stresses, uh, just in time versus just in case activities, um, post-COVID uh, preparedness. Um, and, and, you know, you wrote this one paper, it was entitled The Missing Piece in America's COVID-19 Isolation and Quarantine Strategy, Wraparound Services. Um, what are wraparound services and why are they so instrumental in how we should be thinking about, God forbid, the next COVIDs that are coming? That is an extremely important piece in terms of wraparound services and what we were missing during the COVID-19 pandemic. As you may remember, we kept telling people, if you're exposed, you need to quarantine. If you are confirmed to have COVID-19, you need to isolate, right? Yeah. So much easier said than done because when you look at, for example, just in the New York City lens, right? We have people that live in multi-generational homes that live with a number of people in, in a very small space. They may even have one shared bathroom. So the concept of isolation doesn't exist for certain people, right? For many people actually in the United States, because they don't they don't have that privilege of isolating. They don't have that luxury of space. They don't have that luxury of not being able to to uh, to go out and get their groceries or milk or eggs and the like. And so mm -hmm. one of the missing pieces that we had here in the United States in, during a COVID-19 pandemic response was not providing these services to people that do have to quarantine, that do have to isolate. Because the name of the game during the COVID-19 pandemic is cutting off chains of transmission. We wanted to um, lower uh, the number of people getting infected, and we wanted to protect those that were also most vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. And to do that, people had to quarantine if they were exposed, or they would have to isolate if they were uh, confirmed to have the virus. But a lot of them, as I mentioned, couldn't do so. So these wraparound services was, uh, a, you know, a thought of giving them you know, ongoing food services. So they didn't have to go to the grocery store to get milk and eggs. They didn't have to uh, go to a restaurant to get their meals because they shouldn't be, uh, you know, in contact with other people during that period of isolation. It's giving them the medication that they need. Maybe they had to go pick up their uh, blood pressure medication at the pharmacy because they were only, uh, you know, they only had one pill left, right? So giving that pharmacy services um, and other types of services, laundry, things like that. So anything that you need from, you know, just a service standpoint, giving them those types of resources um, so that way they could safely isolate, they could safely quarantine and not potentially expose other people along the way. And that was a big missing piece. Um, and even giving them a place to actually isolate and quarantine here in New York City, um, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning of uh, my bio, I was the health and safety lead of the, of the Enhanced Investigations Unit of New York City Test and Trace. And this was a huge program of contact tracers that provided uh, services, including wraparound services and even hoteling. Um, yep. One of the things New York City provided was free hoteling for those that had to quarantine or isolate and they weren't able to do so safely uh, at their in their own home. And those are the, those are services that we needed to provide across the board for all Americans, not just here in New York City. And I know many states try to do that, um, not, uh, uh, you know, many states were not able to, but those are the type of services that you need to implement, right? These are people focused. These are focused on making sure that if you do get infected, that you don't transmit the virus to other people. So what can we do to keep you safe and comfortable while you're recovering from, uh, you know, your viral illness? Um, one of the, uh, the topics that, you know, I, I've covered a couple of times on the show, um, has been the, uh, the bipartisan, um, commission on biodefense and have had guests like, uh, Peggy Hamburg, former commissioner of FDA, uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, Congressman Donna Shalala, um, all talking about the, uh, the need for us as a country to have a, uh, an Apollo type moonshot for, for biodefense. They call it the Athena project. Um, you wrote a couple of years ago in the, uh, I think it's the Washington post with, uh, with Ronald Klain at the time, um, specifically about, you know, one program focused on Ebola, but it also mentions anthrax, uh, these programs that we start, but we don't, you know, bring, but let's say to the extent, you know, grow to the extent that we, we require them. And, um, you know, 
PEPFAR has been in the news a lot lately, um, a very successful program on a specific virus. But again, you know, we're arguing about a lot of the, <laughs> these things, whether they should exist or not. Um, say a couple words about, you know, what you think we require in terms of, you know, our country and, and putting our resources to uh, a formal structure for um, for these bio uh, these bio agents for now to cover us <laughs> for the coming decades, because we seem to tear down the programs before they really get even going. We, we do. We, we have, a, you know, unfortunately, a bad history of, of doing that. And in that Washington Post piece that I wrote with um, Ron Klain, it was highlighting you know, one of these pandemic programs um, that we had during the start uh, or, or uh, that actually started um, after or during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. So if folks remember that that was, you know, one of the largest uh, Ebola outbreaks in history. And here in the United States, you know, we had about um, 11 patients, uh, many of them who were medically evacuated um, that were treated here in U.S. soil. But that prompted the U.S. government to really take a close look at itself to say, you know, what, what do we need to do to prepare for these high consequence infectious diseases? And one of the programs that was established as a result of that is what we call these regional centers. Uh, um, they're called regional Ebola and special pathogen treatment centers. So in the United States, we have over 6,000 hospitals. And within these 6,000 hospitals, we wanted to have centers of excellence that could care for patients that have these high consequence infectious diseases like Ebola or like, um, you know, smallpox, if we start seeing that again, hopefully never, but if that does happen. And so we know that not all 6,000 hospitals are equipped to handle these types of high consequence infectious diseases. So we wanted to train a certain workforce uh, within uh, and these designated centers to be able to be ready 24 seven if we start seeing these types of cases. And so in that op-ed, um, that particular program was up for renewal. So Congress was supposed to give additional funding to keep that program alive. And there was no indication from Congress at that time that they would be renewing this very robust program. And that's where we mentioned like this boom and bust cycle has to end. It's gonna keep us vulnerable to the next pandemic that's surely gonna be you know, knocking on our doorsteps. And obviously uh, after we published that op-ed, which was end of December of 2019, uh, you know, we obviously started seeing the COVID-19 pandemic just uh, uh, you know, um, a few weeks later, uh, start from an outbreak and then to a full blown pandemic. But I think what it highlights and to get to your point is we need to have these types of infrastructure in place because we know these bio threats are going to continue to happen. And so what type of, you know, infrastructure um, do we need uh, to ensure that we are protecting Americans and preparing for these types of threats? Hospital is just one piece of the equation. And really hospitals are the last line of defense. You really wanna make sure that you are preparing the public health workforce to first prevent this from happening. That's really the golden standard is preventing this from ever happening. That requires a lot more investment in surveillance and monitoring and making sure we have a good public health and healthcare uh, infrastructure. So that way one case doesn't snowball into a cluster of cases and that cluster of cases doesn't snowball into a full blown outbreak and then go to a pandemic. Um, and so the first part is, you know, what are we doing from a public health standpoint? How what are we doing to increase the workforce there? Because they are uh, surely, uh, sorely um, short of the workforce that they need, uh, along with the resources um, and the capabilities that they need to be able to respond to these types of cases. And then what are we also doing on the back end to ensure hospitals are prepared for these types of events? Do they have the workforce that they need? Do they have the protocols and processes, the training and the resources? So there's a lot that still needs to happen um, as we look at preparing for the next outbreak or the next pandemic. And we've learned a lot from the current COVID-19 pandemic, but what I am afraid of and what I'm already seeing is that boom and bust cycle again happen, similar to what I wrote with Ron Klain in 2019 uh, with this program that luckily was renewed and funding was given, but it was only given to a certain number of facilities. So as I mentioned, we have over 6,000 hospitals in the United States. Every one of those 6,000 hospitals became the battleground for COVID-19. It wasn't just 10 hospitals out of the 6,000. It was every right. single hospital. And so we need to really make sure we are preparing every one of those 6,000 hospitals and giving them what they need to prepare for these bio threats, knowing we live in a world where this is going to continue to happen. Yep, absolutely. And, um, you know, one more piece of uh, of this puzzle, 
uh, is appropriate uh, communication to the public. And, and I very much enjoyed your piece in uh, Disaster Medicine and Public Health Preparedness, June 2022, entitled In Layman's Terms, The Power and Problem of Science Communication. Um, you are an excellent science communicator. I, I enjoy reading your materials, watching you, um, but we have a long way to go in terms, you know, as, as the last couple of years have showed us in terms of educating um, the folks out there. Um, top line uh, learnings uh, from your your own experiences on what we need to do for proper uh, science communication of the public. Well, I think one thing I'll highlight is what's important is that we are leaving this pandemic with less trust in science than we did entering the pandemic. And what this means is that there's a lot of work cut out for all of us. And this is not just people that are in the field of science or in the field of public health or in the field of healthcare. Every single one of us has a role to play in helping build back that trust in science. Because when you don't have trust in science and you are experiencing an outbreak, then anything and everything that you say from a public health or even healthcare perspective, people may not actually follow. So if we do start seeing another outbreak of a respiratory pathogen and we need to wear masks again, you know, are people going to actually take a take us up on that and that public health guidance? Um, and if there's low trust in science, then they may not. Um, and that's what we're going to have to contend with. And so all of us really need to help uh, build back trust in science. All of us should be versed in how to communicate effectively with our loved ones, with our family and friends. And so some of the programs that I've helped uh, establish and that I continue to to work towards is helping not only build back trust in science, but how can we make individuals better science communicators. So one of the programs I'll just very briefly highlight um, that we put together during the COVID-19 pandemic was Be a COVID-19 Vaccine Champion, where we actually trained thousands of New Yorkers on um, A, the importance of getting the COVID-19 vaccine and, and giving them education of how these vaccines were developed and you know how they work in the body. But then the second part of the curriculum that we train them on is how do you be an effective communicator? So yes, you may see a number 90% effective. Yes, you may see another number of you know 2% may experience this type of side effect. How do you translate translate that information into a way that the lay person can understand? They may that that ninety percent is not going to resonate with them. That two percent is not going to resonate with them. All they'll hear is this is a side effect, or this is how, uh, or this is how effective this uh, this vaccine is. So we train them at how do you take this information and communicate it in a way that. A, people can understand, and B, it'll resonate with them. And so we gave them information on how to distill this information down in positive terms, simple language, um, motivational interviewing. And so we trained this entire workforce on A, being a better science communicator, and being, uh, B, helping uh, increase uh, vaccination rates here in New York and address vaccine hesitancy. And that's what we need more of, right? Now, as we head into, obviously, the colder months uh, this year, we're seeing increased levels of flu activity because uh, this is flu season. We're seeing increased levels of RSV activity. We're starting to see now increased levels of COVID-19 activity among other respiratory viruses. And we have the tools to help keep people safe. But if you're just looking at the COVID-19 vaccination rates just this year, only about 15, 16% of Americans have gotten the updated COVID-19 vaccine and less than 50% have gotten the, uh, the flu vaccine this year. So we need to do a lot more and not only building back trust in science, but also communicating the effectiveness of these life-saving tools so that way people can actually protect themselves and their family members. And that's why I wanna, that's why I do what I do in terms of being a science communicator. I wanna make sure people have the information they need to make the best decisions for themselves and their family members. And there is so much bad junk information out there. There's so much missing disinformation out there that is really uh, making a lot of our lives harder in terms of trying to get uh, to get the factual information out there and for people to really understand this is fact from fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, while we're on that topic, um, you know, what one of the uh, the guests that I've hosted on the show uh, several months ago was it was Andrew Hebler uh, from the White House OSTP, uh, also previously the State Department. Um, and you I know, love he took Andrew. Us through... He's amazing. Yeah. Andrew's awesome. Yeah. Um, he took us through sort of the, the gain of function history ban, loss of uh, re reversal of ban and, and, and sort of into where we are now. Um, and, you know, the whole One Health topic obviously has been very important to us and 
topic of spillover uh, that and I, I i misspoke before actually i was thinking of contagion when you were talking about outbreak but nonetheless there's that line in contagion where larry fishburn's like look we don't need to weaponize you know the birds are doing a pretty damn good job of weaponizing the yeah. flu uh, every year uh that being said you know we do have this topic of gain of function research it's controversial uh but you know there's arguments on both sides that this is a uh just like one health and 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 sampling the the virome that's out there on this planet it that we also have to you know study viruses a different way um your thoughts i know you've written uh pieces on gain of function uh give us, give us your top line there if you would yeah well first i think it's a very important topic and with everything right there's risks and there's benefits so with gain of function there are tremendous benefits because it helps us prepare for in eventuality if this if this virus does mutate and become more transmissible into humans uh, and we've tested this in a controlled lab environment then we could take that information and prepare for it before it eventually happens through natural course right um, and help us understand uh, and develop better therapeutics and vaccines so i think there's a benefit there but the risk as you all uh, can imagine is when you're working with these types of um, infectious diseases and you're changing its genetic makeup or adding in additional mutations or what have you and making it you know more either transmissible or more lethal or or um, you know less resistant resistant to any therapeutics um, there's certainly the threat of it either uh, unfortunately having lab accidents or uh, other types of ill intentions um, that can occur during these types of experiments. And that's what we want to make sure it doesn't happen. And we have good safeguards in place. And even having those safeguards in place doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have what we call, you know, what they call a lab leak or an accidental, uh, you know, uh, an accidental incident where, an uh, you know, the lab worker gets infected and then goes out in the community. And unfortunately, now it snowballs into an outbreak. Those are all real, right? Those are all realities that we contend with. History has shown us that has happened before many, many times over. So it's not as if we're making it up and say, well, that's never going to happen. Actually, history has shown us it, ha it has happened many, many times with different types of pathogens, right? From, from anthrax to kind of, you name it, other types of infectious disease threats. Um, and so the question is, A, should we let it happen? And if we do let it happen, at what scale? What type of uh, framework should you put in place? What type of safety measures should you put in place? Um, and kind of go on from there. And, you know, one thing that certainly keeps me up at night among so many other uh, other things I, as I look at the bio threat landscape, but specifically on the biosecurity lens, because I am a biosecurity advisor and I sit on a number of different boards. And this is something that I think about very often is what type of governance and framework structure should we have in place, not here in the United States, not just here in the United States, but around the world, knowing that, for example, as we just look at high containment labs, the number of BSL-4 facilities, which is the highest level um, uh, of a, uh, you know, a of, a of a lab to conduct, um, you know, research on these exotic, um, highly pathogenic um, diseases, we have we are seeing more and more countries develop more of these BSL-4 laboratory facilities. It's actually only increasing in the last decade. Um, and, uh, you know, a colleague uh, of mine from George Mason actually just released a report that did a nice job categorizing the threat, as well as how many of these new BSL-4 facilities are coming online um, just in the next decade. And it is very concerning because we don't have a good governance structure in place. We don't have a good safety framework in place for many of these countries that are developing um, these BSL-4 facilities. So it's a significant concern, particularly for, for me and my colleagues, and we need to uh, do a, a much better job, uh, not just domestically, but internationally. Yeah. Um, now, what, what, one last area I really want to go into, and I, and I have to tell you ahead of time that I'm, uh, I'm a huge Michael Crichton fan and, and Andromeda Strain was <laughs> one of my favorite books and movies of his. Um, April 2020, Health Security Journal. Restricted and uncontained health considerations in the event of loss of containment during the restricted Earth return of extraterrestrial samples. Uh, and you wrote this in collaboration with uh, Dr. Betsy Pugel, who was uh, deputy to, to the Planetary Protection Office at NASA. Um, take us into this, if you would, a little bit about uh, why you wrote it. Um, uh, a little bit of, you know, obviously, you know, we we're just talking about stuff happening on this planet, but. You know, if something's coming back from Mars or elsewhere, uh, we have to prepare. Um, and um, 
if you don't, if, if you can say, if you don't want to say, that's fine. Do, is there a lab somewhere with the nuclear bomb under it in case um, we have to initiate the the scoop protocol? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, but I will say wildfire, wildfire. My fault. The scoop was the the satellite. Yeah. Exactly. I will say that publication with uh, my colleague Betsy and Saskia has probably been one of the most badass publications I have ever written. And I it was really you know, badass. I, I've written a lot and I continue to write a lot. But that that's been one of the the more fun publications that I had the privilege of um writing uh, and publishing with. Uh, and as you've mentioned, um, it's really us thinking outside the box and working with um. Dr. Betsy Pugel, who uh, works at NASA, you know, one of the things that she had brought up to, to me as we work on issues of biosecurity is, you know, as you have uh, these space missions going out and exploring space and bringing back, you know, samples from other planetary bodies, what if there was uh, an accident, meaning that there was uh, the, the, the sample coming back from another planetary body uh, somehow Either the spacecraft explodes or there's just been an unintentional release of these, um, you know, uh, you know, planetary body samples um, here in the United States. And how would we react? What would be the public health response? Right. Because this is th these could be, um, you know, unknown pathogens or unknown agents that we have never seen before. And how would we respond from a public health as well as a healthcare delivery standpoint? And so that paper just really highlights that particular threat in terms of what are we doing, um, really thinking outside the box as we continue this journey of space uh, exploration that really is exploding now, as you know. Um, and we see more and more, you know, different um, samples are being being brought uh, brought back to Earth for uh, for analysis and research. What is our containment strategy and what happens if there's a breach or an explosion? Um, and what should we do from a public health response, right? Because the time to think about these types of threats is now, not when it happens. And yeah. so we want to make sure that we're we're getting into the mindset of thinking through in, uh, these types of scenarios, really thinking outside the box, having a protocol and process in place, just like I do for healthcare systems in the event we might see a disease X. What are we doing from a public health standpoint if we do see this type of threat um, and uh, what type of discussions do we need to have? And so it was really highlighting that specific piece, uh, but it was very fun to write, uh, to, to say the least. I can imagine. I, I can imagine. I, it, it, very, a very bad ass paper. I, I'll, I'll echo that. And, um, and in Hollywood, who wants to who wants to take uh, take us up on, on writing a script on that? We're all ears. It'll be it'll be fun. I, I will I will mention one of my side hobbies beyond the work that I do in public health and healthcare in infectious diseases and biosecurity is, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I do a lot with uh, the film industry of doing docu-series. I've done right. four already. You mentioned the Netflix docu-series pandemic, how to prevent an outbreak, but I've done uh, three additional ones. And then right now I'm an executive producer on a short film that has nothing to do with public health. It has nothing to do with healthcare. It's actually on romance and it talks about um, being a uh, first generation um, Asian in this country and what it feels like to be, you know, first generation and some of the issues you may face and some of the hmm. challenges that your parents may not understand as you're looking at, you know, um, you know, uh, looking at marriage prospects um, and the like. And so I'm an executive producer um, on this very cute short film that's going to be out uh, sometime in 2024. Um, but uh, definitely is something that um, it's fun, I, I would say, is helping kind of, you know, review the script and look at the storyline and, and the like. So these types of articles that I'm now publishing, I'm thinking through, uh, you know, would this be a good documentary or short film to to go along with? Awesome. Awesome. No, I appreciate bringing that up. That, that's really cool. And, and, and also in 2024, you have a book coming out, too. Um, the COVID-19 response in New York City crisis management, largest public health system. Can you say a couple words about what we'll be looking forward to there. Yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, happy and proud to, to, to share that uh, with, with New York City Health and Hospitals and, and two of my really amazing and talented um, editors, um, Dr. Eric Way and Dr. Laura Iva Coley, uh, who really helped shape this book. And it's really about the history of New York City Health and Hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic and the heroic work that really uh, went on behind the scenes that continues to happen today to really contend with this global threat that we face and how New York City initially, as it was the epicenter of the epicenter, how we fought through the COVID-19 pandemic 
and it outlines all the different aspects that you would think uh, a health, uh, you know, a hospital and a very large health system would have to do. So everything from preparing from the for the COVID nineteen pandemic to PPE to staff, uh, you know, to supplies. So it really walks you through the full gamut of what this health system that is just so amazing. Uh, really experienced uh, over the course of this multi-year mass casualty uh, event um, that was protracted uh, for a very extended period of time. So I'm very excited uh, to share that that book is going to be available uh, in 2024. The pre-orders um, are available now and it'll be released in 2024. And so um, it's going to be really uh, a deep dive into the really important topics and help prepare the next generation of public health and healthcare leaders um, if and when they have to deal with another pandemic of this scale and they'll have a framework to work off of. Awesome. Really awesome. Um, books, docu-series, docu-dramas, obviously <laughs> complex scientific research, um, bio-preparedness. Did I miss anything? Any, anything else happening as we get into 2024 that we should know about? Uh, please uh, take the floor as we begin. Well, I, I think I scared your audience. <laughs> more than enough so I won't say more more than that but you know I think it's really just going back to the basics where we live in a globalized world we're going to continue to see many different bio threats both naturally occurring and even potentially uh intentional um, and deliberate in their use and so what are we doing to have a good infrastructure in place both domestically and internationally what are we doing to educate our our our, uh, our citizens on these threats so that way in the event this does happen they can have trust in these these established entities like CDC and their local health department and their healthcare system to be able to protect themselves and then what are we doing to make sure that we have you know the vaccines and therapeutics that we need um you know to to be able to save as many lives as possible and equally as important what are we doing to prevent this all from ever happening right so a lot of work cut out for us Many of us um, are working in this field and we love what we do, but it, it requires a village. Um, so I would say you know, one of the things that people can do to help us as we are in this field of you know, pandemic prevention and pandemic preparedness and outbreak response is anytime you see a, legis a piece of a legislation or a piece of, you know, um, uh, you know, piece of um, uh, language that you could, um, you know, reach out to your uh, your elected official to help either sign or promote. We certainly encourage people to do so. So there's a lot, obviously, on the docket, whether it's PEPFAR or the Pandemic and All Hazard Response Act and the like. People yep. certainly uh, can use their voice to say this is important and we want to make sure our elected officials get behind this piece of legislation and sign it so that way we have the resources um, and the willpower to actually act and, and do what we do best, which really is to not only prevent, but prepare for these types of events. Outstanding. Very outstanding. Awesome work. I mean, I, I um, it's just an amazing portfolio. I, I'm so, you know, honored to take the, you know, that you had the opportunity to come talk to us about it and really wishing you the best with all of it as you continue to, to move it forward and, and keep us, safe. I have a son up in New York City at NYU now, so I'm glad that you're there <laughs> while he's there, uh, keeping everything safe. So um, really, really great stuff. Um, yeah, again, for everybody who uh, are going to be listening to this particular episode of our podcast uh, across the various uh, networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, again, you've been spending time with Dr. Saira Madad, Senior Director, System-Wide Special Pathogens Program, New York City Health and Hospital hospitals. Uh, Saira, again, thank you for taking the time to come on for a little while today and talk about what you're up to. I see. Thank you for what you do. And as we like to say here on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via what you do. A really awesome story. Thank you so much, Iris. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you and to, to share, you know, so much information on, on what, what what we do. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, your, your uh, listeners take away some good nuggets of, of wisdom um, sure. And uh, appreciate you giving the platform to many of us to share our stories. Great having you.